as every film archive in the world, we are maybe we are, we are on the way to um, create something like a digital archive, but we could not really claim that um, we are the perfect example for a digital archive as far as it comes to film material itself. So it, uh, I will t talk about that um, subject as it is here, a museum and more, and want to uh, present you um, a way uh, an uh, institution uh, underwent during uh, the last decades and why now we consider ourselves uh, to be a museum um, and more because uh, many changes uh, in the history were involved. Um, some of you may have already visited the Museum of Film and Television at Potsdamer Platz and this is the first, uh, the first room. So you enter into uh, uh, Salle de Miroir um, and you hopefully will forget that you are right in the center of Berlin in, at Potsdamer Platz in a building which is supposedly a museum but already uh, really looks like um, uh, an office building and this is what is, was designed uh, for to be an office building. And so our architect, and we'll talk uh, uh, more about him um, later, tried to create an experience which um, really convinces you that you are leaving the real world and entering the world um, of movies. Our institution was founded in 1963, so we are a bit younger uh, than the Hungarian Film Archive. Um, and this is on the left, our founding father, film director, collector, film historian, um, Gerhard Lamprecht. His collection is the base, uh, or was the base, and still is the base in 1963. And this is the evening of the um, celebration for the founding of the, as, as it was called at that time, uh, Stiftung Deutsche Kinematik. And he invited two of his close friends, uh, Henri Longlois and Lotte Eisner. So you see that uh, even in the beginning of an institution like ours, the uh, interaction and the cooperation with other colleagues from other archives played uh, a major role. Uh, and um, in a way, the uh, close friendship between Henri Langlois, uh, Lotte Eisner, and Gerhard Lamprecht was the mean to uh, guarantee that our institution was founded because um, the Senate of Berlin um, was a bit um, hesitating uh, to buy the collection of uh, Gerhard Lamprecht and another collector, a film collector, and to establish something like a German um, cinematic. So um, <clears throat> Gerhard Lamprecht and Henri Longlois uh, played a game. Um, it was clear that um, Henri Longlois supported the foundation of the German cinematic, uh, but knowing by his friend that there are some difficulties, he wrote a letter to him, to Gerhard Lamprecht, saying, well, I'm willing to buy your collection. And that uh, convinced the Senate that there are international interests, and that uh, convinced them also so, to give the money. In 1963, there is a famous interview in uh, the German television, the Berlin television at that time, and uh, Gerhard Lamprecht is standing proudly in front of his apparatuses unique items, uh, cameras, projectors, and he's facing the camera and saying, well, this is just a part of our collection and um, very soon you will be able to see it in our museum. That was back in 1963 and it took 37 years uh, to establish a museum. So that's why, in a way, uh, the institution which should be a museum for a long, long time was not a museum, which shaped the identity um, of the institution, because what could they do? They had uh, small, uh, small exhibitions and they collected. They collected and collected and collected and made the collections accessible to other museums and especially to scholars. So mainly uh, the, the DNA of the um, uh, Deutsche Kinematik, the German Cinematik, for decades was mainly to be an archive, uh, not to be a museum a film archive as well, because the film collectors, um, Lamprecht and uh, Fledelius, um, gave more than 10,000 uh, film titles to the collection. And so they distributed films, but they lacked the way to present 
what they had. They, they were neither a museum nor do they have a cinema. There was the Friends of the German Cinematic. Uh, they founded the Arsenal and sometimes they played um, films from our collection, but we never took curatorial, a curatorial role in that. So if you are in that situation, um, and if I put it a bit uh, less friendly, uh, then the attitude towards the people who are coming to you is strictly an archival one. And archives can wait, because they do have something people are interested in. And if they, are want, if they want to see it, they have to come. They have to visit you especially in the time where uh, no internet was available and no online collections were available. So it was another, um, another attitude uh, necessary when the museum was founded. Because museums can't wait. Museums have to advertise. Museums do not have um, users, they have visitors. Uh, and they have to make sure that they are coming. That was also a bit in the DNA in that time, and uh, I show you what wh the place where the museum originally in the 1980s should have been built. This is the old Hotel Esplanade. At that time, the only surviving building at Potsdamer Platz, and that should be the new film museum. And here you see three of the staff members visiting the old Hotel Esplanade. Uh, on November 9th in 1989, the situation changed, and soon it became clear that this no longer was no man's land, but it was the center of the city. And um, the Senate decided that in the center of the city, a small building like the Hotel Esplanade would not be appropriate, uh, but supported the idea of um, including the uh, German Cinematic, the Cinema Arsenal, and the German Film and television academy in the building at the Potsdamer Platz, and that's how it looks now. Ironically, part of the Hotel Esplanade, um, the so-called Kaisersaal, was moved just 100 meters. Um, Sony paid for it, and now uh, this Kaisersaal is part of the Sony Center, not part of the film house, but part of the Sony Center. So in a way, um, next door, the um, the, the original idea of having a film house uh, at Potsdamer Platz still is visible in a way. What we are doing, yeah, we present a permanent exhibition and I um, go through um, the um, rooms of the uh, exhibition to give you an impression of what we are trying to do. I have to say that most of the parts of the, or most of the um, narration of uh, the uh, permanent exhibition uh, was conceived in uh, 2000. The museum opened in 2000, and it um, was changed only slightly, uh, resulting in the situation that nowadays um, visitors come to uh, our house and um, they are facing TV screens ratio 1 to 1.33 um, in pile quality. So this is a bit of disadvantage. We have to work on that as well, but still the architecture and the way we present objects uh, interests the audience. This is uh, the first room, and this is um, one of the designs our uh, architect um, Charles developed during the process of how could we in this office building present uh, an exhibition on film. This is the Metropolis room in his first uh, draft, and this is how it looks like. It's a bridge. Yeah. So we do have two floors for this effect. Um, and you see, it's, it, it looked like, uh, it doesn't look like 1 to 1 1.33, but it is, and it's pi. Um, then, obviously, it's not only uh, an exhibition about uh, the German. Um, film uh, industry and the German film history. It's, uh, inter it's also the relations to uh, international film history. And on the left side, you see the first uh, Oscar ever given to an actor. It was even, um, Emil Jennings who won it in 1928 for three films, one of them uh, with Sternberg. And we were given that by his niece. 
So it's the international relations play a role, and certainly in the case of Marlene Dietrich. This is one of the highlights of the museum, certainly because uh, Marlene never threw anything away, and we were lucky, the lucky, in the lucky situation to get everything what she did not throw away. So this is only a small part of what we could, ex uh, could present on um, Marlene Dietrich. Uh, we are in the lucky situation that we can every year change all of the costumes um, because costumes are very fragile. Um, and even if we present uh, as much as we do uh, on Marlene Dietrich, it's no problem for us to organize uh, parallel uh, temporary exhibitions elsewhere, which we did very often. So this is how it looks like when you come to the period of National Socialism. You have to open the, the walls to um, confront yourself with the documents there. And then in 2009, we gave more space to current German film. This is the first draft, again, from Hans-Dieter Schaal, and this is how it looks like now. And we are able to include uh, the, the very present by um, uh, giving um, a showcase to the German Film Prize every year. So there is always the film who wins the Film Prize presented in our museum, and uh, this gives the audience, the younger audience, at least uh, the feeling that there are some films dealt with they know, uh, which is necessary. In 2006, we also um, became uh, an institution responsible for television. This was not the case up to 2006, even if our distribution department had many, many films shot on 16 mil or 35 documentaries, independent films, which were originally shot for um, a television, but had a cinema career, and we distributed them, like the great um, documentary filmmakers like Wildenhahn and others. So being a museum means we have to take care for the youngest audience, so we organize children's exhibition, sorry, uh, many times. And obviously, we do have uh, the opportunity to present um, temporary exhibitions, and this is a wide range of subjects we can deal with. Uh, famous directors like um, Hitchcock, famous films like Metropolis, when Metropolis was um, rediscovered, or a print of Metropolis was discovered in Buenos Aires. Paula Didier came to us and we saw it, and uh, we, and together with the Munoz Stiftung, uh, restored the film, thanks to Paula, and uh, so we dedicated an exhibition to the complete Metropolis. Still, it's not complete, as you know, still uh, 10 minutes or so uh, missing. But the um, exhibition almost was complete because we could show everything we had to Metropolis, and this is really um, a lot. And thanks to the uh, exchange with the colleagues from La Cinematique Française, we included many of the items there, and unusual perhaps, but uh, perhaps also a model. Uh, we agreed upon um, digitizing all the photographs in each collection and giving uh, the um, digitized data, the digitized things to the other institutions. So now, if you want to see photographs from about Metropolis, uh, we both are almost um, 100%, uh, we, we, we own 100% or make visible 100% of what survived from that time. So we had an exhibition in Ingmar about Ingmar Bergman, first in Los Angeles, then in Berlin. We do things like um, looking at storyboards and how storyboards may influence uh, not only uh, playing their role in uh, making a film, but may influence also um, recent artists as you see there. And then in 2009, we made a further step, and that's why um, the term digital comes here into um, um, in the program, in a way. Uh, Moments in Time was an exhibition um, dedicated to um, the years uh, the wall went down and came down. And we, um, we published project and asked for uh, individuals, individuals to send us photographs and films. 
Um, the idea behind that was uh, when you were living in the GDR or visiting the GDR or living in uh, West Germany after the wall came down and you were a photographer or uh, amateur filmmaker, you most probably would have shot photographs and films which are dealing with these kind, with this situation of uh, a major change in, in German history and the response was great. We had uh, more than 8,000 um, uh, photos which were given to us in more than 40 hours of film. We digitized them all. And the thing was, we wanted to present it in an exhibition. And in the exhibition, together with television coverage and material from documentary filmmakers. But we created an online archive. Uh, we digitized all the items from um, the people who gave us the material, we gave back the original materials, and we made accessible online by a, a certain, um, a certain how do you call it, um, CCC license, um, made, made available all the material online and researchable, and there, is, uh, the, there are the stories behind it. You can g ask for a date an event, a location, things like that. And that worked quite well. Um, nowadays, we have included uh, also on that online archive material from the television station. They were reluctant in the beginning. And also some films licensed for five years, mainly films from students made in West Berlin and in Potsdam. But this... Um, Online archive uh, was, um, yeah, it was in a way, it was a selling uh, point for us because once we had the structure and once we knew how to do it, we knew that we found a way to present collections we do have online to make it accessible and it's a curated thing. It's not just that you digitize your items and then make it available um, in uh, the internet. It's something uh, like an exhibition in, uh, uh, a sp not in the space, but in uh, the virtual space. And we learned from that and did it um, not only once, but we uh, asked, for example, Ken Adam um, and Isvan Chavo was as friendly to come to Berlin to talk about his cooperation uh, in our museum with Ken Adam. Um, we well, in the lucky situation that Ken Adam um, made a huge gift to us, uh, he gave us everything um, he had from his um, artworks, and this is more than uh, 5,500 sketches. And we promised him to make an exhibition, and that was the challenging point, because if you're going to do an exhibition about one of the most famous production designers in the world, um, and you invite him and his um, charming lady, Letizia, uh, to uh, open uh, the exhibition, then you really fear that he will come to the room and say, well, it's ugly. You can't do that with me. Um, but fortunately, he liked it, um, and he loved it in a way. So um, we added, and this was important for him. The, the exhibition was important for him, for us also, but for us, uh, it was as uh, important as important uh, as the exhibition to have uh, Ken Adam online archive, which functions like um, the, the other one, Wir waren so frei, so you can uh, find every single sketch of these 5, more than 5,500 sketches. Um, you find comments, you find the context, you can relate these sketches to the films made Based on these sketches, you can compare films. Um, so it's a research tool which is, um, I think, very, uh, very practical. And we did it also, excuse me, for the German Film and Television Academy. <laughs> bit, uh, as a bit older than we, it was founded a year earlier. And no, a year later younger. And um, there we included films from, because it's the um, copyright is held uh, by the film school, we could um, include films from the students. And 
these are names like Wolfgang Petersen, uh, Harun Farocki, Christian Petzold, Thomas Arslan, uh, and others. So you can not only uh, learn a lot about the uh, first uh, years, uh, first decades of uh, the um, film and fancy academy, film and television academy, but you can also see the films produced in this school. Now we are working uh, on presentations in going in this direction. Josef Fenneker, one of the uh, major um, arts artists who were working for film industry and making producing posters, mainly known for the f uh, films um, with his posters from the um, expressionist film era in Germany, but he worked uh, up to the 30s, and we own all of these surviving um, sketches and um, posters, and we will bring that, you see it's ongoing, upcoming, we will bring that um, online in the next month, I think. Should be online, but still is not. Um, let me end with this uh, chapter to um, talk a bit about um, what we are also doing. We are not only um, showing um, temporary exhibitions in um, our museum, we are trying to um, to develop exhibitions which can travel, and Martin Scorsese certainly is the uh, most uh, traveling uh, exhibition so far. The last uh, was in Amsterdam, um, very successful, I heard, and it was beautiful because at every um, uh, new city, it looks different because the, the space is different. So that's how it looked in Berlin, Paris, and finally in um, New York. But uh, we started, in a way, uh, as being a film archive. You know that the situation in Germany is different. Like in uh, Hungary, we don't have um, just one film archive. We do have the National Film Archive, the Bundesarchiv, which is certainly the center for uh, film storage and film uh, preservation. But there are also our uh, um, film archive with more than 20,000 film titles and the German Film Institute DIFF with around, uh, I think, 16,000. So there is a cooperation, close cooperation uh, between these institutions. And now we are on the way to have something like a digitization program. Not as good as in many other European countries, not comparable to what the French or the Hungarians or the Danish or uh, Dutch uh, already ha could have done, but we are on our way. Um, and we hope that this will result in a plan for the next 10 years, uh, making available a certain sum of money, it's talking about 10 uh, million euros um, a year, which would be a very good um, first step. And uh, the, this year, the second year we organized because of this situation, we organize and will still organize during the next years a little uh, film festival and a symposium called Film Restored, where we do present films which were digitized during the last 12 months. Up to now, just German films, because it's also a promotion tool to make people and politicians aware that our digitized films look great and that these old films are great films and digitization and restoration of this film is necessary. And if you see a film, it's really a pleasure to look like that, to look at films like that. So, and this works a bit um, and we hope it will con contribute to um, making uh, sure that this uh, digitization program will start um, next year, perhaps. Uh, we'll see. So some films we digitized um, during the last uh, two years. Westfront 1918, well, this is the famous Pabst film, like this one. This is just, uh, it, it's not a poster, it's a design for a poster. It's Kameradschaft, also a film by Georg Wilhelm Pabst. Both were shown last year, and we were talking about the discoveries you can make if you're seeing films from the 50s almost forgotten, um, like yesterday, the marvelous film Merry Go Round. Uh, this is one of the examples we did. Um, Zwei unter Millionen will ja 
von Liebske, the director is Liebske, and it's a very good film, um, but it's an unknown film, and this uh, should be changed, and Film Restored is also a tool to change this. So I think I'm at the end uh, of my presentation, and forgive me that I was not talking about uh, digital archive um, so much. Thank you. Okay, Vampire certainly is not an unknown film. It's a well-known masterpiece. Um, and restoration was um, done by Martin Körber, who, as you know, was working at the German Cinematique um, one and a half decade ago, I guess, maybe even um, a bit more. And um, we thought this might be a very good film for this program because the cameraman, um, Rudolf Mati, uh, plays an important role um, in this case. Um, Rudolf Mati was born in Krakow. He studied in um, Budapest and he began to work uh, in film to, with Alexander Korda. So he, uh, first, his first steps in uh, film were in the Hungarian film industry. And then he uh, went to Germany and worked to, for the first time with Karl Theodor Dreyer, the director of Vampire, in 1924, when he was the assistant cameraman to Karl Freund. Uh, and uh, he obviously impressed uh, Dreyer a lot. So uh, Dreyer uh, hired him as the chief cameraman for La Passion de Jeanne d'Arc and for Vampire, two films very, very different in style. Um, and very, very uh, much uh, visually um, astonishing. I mean, they, they are two extremes, uh, so to speak, visually. Um, but uh, that you see that uh, Rudolf Mathieu was a cameraman who could do things like this. Later, you know, he worked as a director as well, uh, D.O. A, Dead on Arrival is one of the titles, and When Worlds Collide, and so. Um, the restoration, or the, yeah, the restoration of this film was uh, done in the uh, times of analog uh, film. And um, as in many cases, um, the uh, discoveries during this process were uh, astonishing. Uh, Dreyer shot uh, all scenes in uh, on a silent film and just the dialogue scenes in the three languages, in German, French, uh, and English. So far, the English version seems just to survive in a fragment. So he had uh, the um, scenes without dialogue and the scenes with dialogue. And to produce a print, uh, he cut into the negative the dialogue scenes and then made a print. And that he had to do for every version, for the German, for the French, and for the English version. Uh, more complicated was that there was also uh, a soundtrack, um, com uh, music soundtrack, composed by Wolfgang Seller. So that has to be adapted to the scenes. The scenes were not, the dialogue scenes were not all exactly of the same length. So for, for example, in the French version there, at some point, um, it was necessary to, um, to add some frames of black film just to keep it uh, in sync with the, with the music. Um, because Martin Kerber has done the restoration, uh, I read from um, his report published in, um, at that time, the, uh, the uh, periodical of um, the Deutsche Kinematik, because he did a splendid job, but he found out that uh, something is still uh, not absolutely clear because the uh, original version um, was of 2,271 meters, and the longest one uh, we found was 2,004 meters. Some scenes are missing which are in uh, the original script. And um, what happened then? Uh, so, I quote. 
my personal, uh, it's my, not my, it's uh, Martin's. Uh, Martin's personal opinion is that Dreyer reworked the film entirely after he had to go back to it to fulfill the German census requirements. Most likely, larger pieces from the previous editing and mix were kept, and that would explain why some of the music changes are rather abrupt and occur in all versions at the same point. Another possibility is that entire scenes from all reels of the finished film were chopped out after Dreyer was unhappy with the reactions of the audience in Berlin at the premiere. There is an article in the Berlin trade paper Film Kurier suggesting that such an operation has taken place as early as after the first two showings on May 6, 1932. So this remains uh, unsolved so far, but what you will see now um, is a film not um, in, with the length of the original premiere, but um, a very, very um, good film, and still, uh, I think, um, yeah, may maybe Martin is right. Right, um, he, Dreyer was perhaps the one to make the final cut. Um, even if forced to do it, he did a great job, and um, you'll see a masterpiece. Thank you.